Yes, I seem to have heard of Ithaca, even on Crete's broad island far across the sea, and now I've reached it myself with all this loot, and I'm left behind in equal measure for my children. I'm a fugitive now, you see. I killed Idomeneus' son, Oriscolius. Um, now, this Oriscolius, uh, uh, this story will immediately make us think back to Book 10 of the Iliad and the night raid when he and, uh, and Diomedes jacked poor Dolan and cut off his head. We're told he tried to rob me from all the spoil I'd won at Troy. I went to uh, the, the plunder, I went to Helen back to secure. This is interesting to Helen back, right? We think of the journey to the underworld. Cleaving my way through wars, I refused to please his father and serve under him at Troy. I led my own command. So now with a friend, again, we think about Diomedes. I lay in wait by the road. I killed him just loping in from the fields with one quick stroke of my bronze spear in the dead of night. The heavens pitch black. No one can see us. Spot me tearing out his life with a weapon honed for action. Once I cut him down, I made a ship and, be and begged the Phoenician crew for mercy instead of the Phaeacians as the Phoenicians, paying those decent hands. In other words, the story that Odysseus tells this young kid, who's going to be Athena, is that, yeah, I'm a fugitive because I killed somebody who was the son of somebody because that, son that father tried to make me, um, you know, uh, uh, beneath him in Troy, and so I killed him in cover of night. Whoa, it's an interesting story that he turns, and Athena is going to uh, finally uh, play her game with Odysseus at line 325. As the story ended, Athena, gray-eyed, gleaming, broke into a smile. This is fascinating. What makes Athena glare and what makes her smile? She loves the fact that, uh, that Odysseus so quickly can generate this lie and spin it, right? She strokes him with her hand. She appears as a woman, beautiful, tall, skilled at weaving lovely things. And it's at this point that this notion of weaving comes full circle. From Penelope, of course, weaving and unweaving for all those years to keep the suitors at bay and all of that, to all of the other weavings that we've seen, especially from Helen earlier, all comes to this moment when Athena is herself skilled at weaving lovely things. Her words went flying straight across, uh, straight toward Odysseus, and she will say it this way at line uh, 328. Any man, any god who met you would have to be some champion lying cheat to get past you for all round craft and guile. In other words, you're the best liar I've ever met. You, she says, terrible man, foxy, ingenious. We think of Machiavelli's prince in his comments about if you're going to be a good leader, you've got to be a good liar. Never tired of twists and tricks. It's not twists and turns, it's twists and tricks. So, not even here on native soil would you give up those wily tales that warm the cockles of your heart. Come, Enough of this now. We're both old hands at the arts of intrigue. Here among mortal men, you're far the best at tactics, spinning yarns. And I'm famous among the gods for wisdom, cunning wiles too. And it's at this point that she will say it. You never recognized me, did you? All those times that I was with you. She says, now I'm here once more to weave a scheme with you, to hide the treasure trove. And, he, and she says it, to tell you all the trials you must suffer, in your palace, and then at line 350 she says it, you're going to have to endure a lot more. You must. You have no choice. And to no one, no man, no woman, not a soul, reveal that you are the wanderer home at last. No. In silence you must bear a world of pain. Subject yourself to the cruel abuse of men. Let's pause for a moment and put it in our notes. The idea is, you've gone through a lot, you got a whole lot more that you've got to go through. That's those final lines of Whitman at the conclusion of A Song of the Open Road, Understand Me Well, For Every Accomplishment, A Greater Struggle is Necessary. Same gig going on here. In other words, you've got another odyssey that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to do, take, but it's going to be one that you're going to have to bear in silence, right? Odysseus, however, will reply in a similar way to it that he replied to Calypso when she told him it was time for him to go bye-bye. He says, oh, goddess. You're so hard for a mortal man to know on sight, however shrewd he is. The shapes you take are endless. But I know this, he says, you were kind to me in the war years as long as the men of Achaea soldiered on in Troy. But once we had sacked Troy, right, again, Troy keeps coming back, I never saw you. My heart forever tore to pieces inside my chest. In other words, where have you been all of these years, right? Um, I, and then he says it, tell me the truth, am I really in Ithaca? Athena, she says, always the same at line 374, right? That's why I can't forsake you in your troubles. You're so winning, so worldwide, so self-possessed. In other words, this is what makes you such an amazing man to me, she says. 
You're always the skeptic. You're always probing. You're always wanting to know. In, the, uh, in many ways, readers of this poem have pointed out, this is the distinction between Achilles. You remember what he said in book nine, I hate the man who says one thing and holds another in his heart. This is, of course, Odysseus. Athena is far more attracted to Odysseus, and we will say, in many ways, this is the birth of the modern psyche, right? The birth of the modern individual. Always the skeptic, always probing. I'm not sure about this. She will say, you know, two things. One, I knew you were going to make it back, so who cares if it was 20 years you've been gone? And two, it was about Poseidon. She blames it on the gods. Notice how it's always this notion of blame someone else, never take personal responsibility. She, she blames it on the gods. Poseidon was upset. I didn't want to get in the way of it. One of the interesting ideas that scholars have pointed out is the difference of worldview here between gods and men and humans. Notice for Athena, it's no big deal, so it took you 20 years. But remember, she never dies. She's immortal. She does not, nor can she fully appreciate that Odysseus has lost 20 years of his life along with Penelope, that they never get back. And it's often uh, been said that Athena can't understand the pain, really, the suffering, that Odysseus and Penelope, and obviously Telemachus, have gone through, right? Speaking of Penelope, Athena does mention her at 383. You must put your wife to the proof yourself, she says. That's what you want. She, she waits in your holes as always. Her life, an endless hardship. Just to remind us again that Penelope has been on her own quest, her own odyssey, an odyssey of pain, right? Wasting away the nights, weeping away the days. I never had doubts myself, so I knew deep down you'd always return at last. Then she will say it. Let's take care of, some, uh, of, of hiding your, your stuff, right? Um, and by that, she means, let's go ahead and put that stuff in the cave, right? And she allows, finally, at line 400, at these words, the goddess scattered the mist, the country stood out clear, and the great man, who had borne so much, rejoiced at last, thrilled to see his Ithaca. He kissed the ground, made a prayer at once, he begs that his son will be allowed to come to manhood. And then Athena will say at line 411, Courage, free your mind of all that anguish now. Come, quick, let's bury your treasures here in some recess of the cave, and let's make our plan so we can win the day. They do exactly this. And she puts, a, a, like Polyphemus with his boulder, she seals the cave. Down they sit, they sat at line 425 by the sacred olive trunk not lost on us from our study of Hamilton's mythology, the olive tree is, of course, Athena's tree, to plot the death of the high and mighty suitors. So again, we're already coming back to the, some of the stuff that we studied in the Iliad. The reason we did such a close reading of the Iliad is so that we can come to appreciate some of the lines and references that are being made here, right? The bright-eyed goddess Athena led the way. Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, old campaigner. By the way, notice Odysseus does not ask about his father. He's only mentioned his son and occasionally his wife, right? Think how to lay your hands on all those brazen suitors, lording it over your house now, three whole years courting your noble wife, offering gifts to win her. But she, forever brokenhearted for your return, builds up each man's hopes, dangling promises. We think of Queen Elizabeth here, don't we, who never got married, but was always kind of using the promise of marriage dangling promises, dropping hints to each, but all the while with something else in mind. In other words, Penelope is going to be the counter, in many ways, the flip side of Odysseus. She's also a really fine, wily deceiver, a weaver of words, right? God help me, Odysseus will say. Um, clearly I might have died the same ignoble death as Agamemnon, bled white in my own house too, if you had never revealed this to me now, goddess, point by point. In other words, Odysseus is ready to go, and it tells you, in the back of his mind, the story of Agamemnon and his homecoming with Clytemnestra, and of course getting jacked by Aegisthus, her lover, all of that factors into his thinking. But he says it, come, weave us a scheme so I can pay them back. He said this fundamental level, the Odyssey is of course a revenge story, right? Stand beside me, Athena, fire me with daring fear, says the day we rip Troy's glittering crown of towers down. Notice how we keep coming back to Troy. Stand by me. Furious now is then my bright-eyed one, and I would fight 300 men, great goddess, with you to brace me, comrade in arms in battle. Everything from here, of course, is building towards Book 22, when in fact Odysseus does that very thing. We get Athena's plan. 
she points out that the suitors have violated Zania, which gives them the right to die, right? Uh, this takes us back to what Tiresias said, I have a feeling some will splatter your ample floors with all their blood and brains. In other words, we're going to have a serious slaughter that will be coming. She says, I'm going to transform you into an old beggar. You're going to go to the swine herd. I'm off to Sparta. I'm going to make sure that Telemachus's journey, right, is, is, um, is finishing up and he's come back. Odysseus will ask, um, um, at line um, 478 or so, shrewd Odysseus asks, why not tell Telemachus the truth? You know it all. Or is he too, like father, like son, condemned to hardship, roving over the barren salt sea while strangers devour a livelihood right there? In other words, is Telemachus got to go through the same kind of pain that I go through? She says, no need for anguish. Trust me at 480. Not for him. I escorted your son myself so he might make his name by sailing there. It's all about the Kleos, right? The, gl the glory. Nor is he saddled down with any troubles now. He sits at ease in the halls of Menelaus, bathed in endless bounty. True enough. Some young lords in a black clutter lurk in ambush, poised to kill the prince before he reaches home, but I have my doubts they will. Sooner the earth will swallow down a few of those young gallants who eat you out of house and home these days. It's fascinating to think about the subtleties of what we, what we just read. Notice, don't worry about your boy sitting in Minulaeus' um, um, palace. He's having a great time. How will that have to sting Odysseus? Menelaus, who lost Helen, and is the reason that Odysseus had to go and fight at the walls of Troy for 10 years and then another 10 years to get home. His boy, Telemachus, is with that Menelaus, and Odysseus does not get to see his boy, Telemachus, but Menelaus does, gets to hang out with him. You can imagine the heart pain of that one. She then will change Odysseus with her one, and he will change the wrinkled hide of an old man, dim the fire in his eyes that used to shine there, gives him um, an old cloak, a staff, a beggar's sack, torn and tattered. It's all about the bag that you carry, and the bag that he's going to carry is an old one slung from a frayed rope. All pants made. They went their separate ways. Athena setting off to bring Telemachus home. Um, and, and, of course, then we're going to have the famous reunion between father and son. Okay, let's finish quickly at 2A. Well, I mean, it goes without saying, but let's say it nonetheless. Getting what you want, that is to say getting home, sometimes takes a really, really long time. And finally, Odysseus is there. That is to say, the things that matter don't come easy. Athletes, of course, and musicians can say, <laughs> right, with a shaking and nodding of the head, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Sometimes, let's think about another topic here, the, uh, another message. Sometimes helping others, that is to say Zinnia, can actually get you jacked. It's not going to save you. It's going to actually get you, get you, get you hurt. The the Phaeacians get have to pay for the zinnia that they gave. Finally, the question of theodicy, right? Why do why do bad things happen to people that don't seem to deserve it? Well, this text says there's really no accounting for it. The gods are really arbitrary in this regards, regardless of what Zeus says in the opening lines that it's all men's fault. And of course, remember he uses the story of Aegisthus to try to prove that one. But here with the Phaeacians, I mean, we just can't buy it. At level two B. The symbolism. Well, the stone, the ship that turns to stone, obviously is a symbol for God's will, which is kind of inscrutable. For readers of the uh, Hebrew Bible, think about that Deuteronomy 29, 29 verse, the secret things belong to God. In other words, there's no way to explain it. Or the book of Job and that theodicy and that um, suggestion as well. God's ways are inscrutable. Here we get the same idea. Think about how Ithaca is a symbol as well, a symbol of home, we might say. The goal, we might say. The irony it to be, well, Odysseus is obviously this amazing liar, but he himself hates to be cheated. Notice that. It didn't even occur to him to say, well, you know, I'm a really great liar, and I've really kind of jacked a lot of people up, so I guess if the Phoenicians jacked me up, it's probably par for the course, and it makes sense. No, no, not for Odysseus. He expects other people to follow the rules, but he himself will, of course, say, I don't always have to follow the rules. I am somewhat special in that regard. Notice the irony. Odysseus will curse the Phaeacians for their help because he thinks that they have in fact cheated him. The irony, of course, will be that they are in fact punished for their Xenia by Poseidon and Zeus, right? Well, at level 3A, the Iliad is, you know, we're making our connections here. Well, obviously, I've already said this, right? Um, in many ways, Odysseus's story is kind of a reworking of Iliad 10, right? Dolan getting jacked in Iliad 10. And of course, in the Iliad, right, Odysseus 
and, um, and Penelope kind of represented the Odyssey, what Achilles said he hated most in Book 9 of the Iliad, that person who says one thing and holds another in his heart. Uh, another 3A question, what's your favorite coming home text? Some will say those final scenes at the return of the king, especially when the young hobbits are sitting in that in that uh, little bar, that little tavern, and they're drinking their, their beer, their mead, uh, and looking around, and no one realizes what it is that they've gone through. The journey, of course, defines who you are, but when you come back home, often people have no clue at all about the ways that you've been changed. We're gonna see some of this played out, obviously, in the next books. Well, at 3B, as we ask the question, how can I relate personally to this, what is, the thing you worked hardest for in your life and finally got it, right? Think about that one as it relates to our reading of the Odyssey. How about this one? Think about those poor Phaeacians. What was the time when you were jacked for doing something actually kind? In other words, you did something good and for that you actually got jacked for that. What was the time, how about this one? What was the time you misunderstood someone's kindness or help and you thought you were actually being poorly treated? And that is to say, like Odysseus, you, you cursed the Phaeacians only to discover, oh, 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 no, 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 they totally kept their word in every way, right? Well, that's book 13. And now books 14 through 21, put this in your notes, are all kind of building towards book 22, the culmination, which will, of course, be the Iliad-like slaughter scene, right, that will lead us to that moment when Odysseus is face to face with all these nasty suitors. Before we get there though, Odysseus's character will end up being rounded out by our poet with some important conversations. The first of those happening in book 14 with the swineherd and um, the story that Odysseus will tell to the swineherd that goes on and on and on. It's going to remind us of Nestor's storytelling in the Iliad, and in fact, Odysseus will borrow Nestor's line, oh, to be young again. Those of you who have read the Iliad with me, you'll remember that line, right? We're going to play the same game in Book 14. I'm going to make the argument when I do Book 14 with you guys. I'm going to make the argument that Book 14 is actually a really important book, although many of my students will say, why are we going to have this long story kind of stuff? I mean, dude, let's just get on with it. You're going to kill the suitors. Okay, let's go, let's go. I think Book 14 is an important step as we develop the character of Odysseus. Come back and we'll go to work with book 14. Thank you.